Chapter 16, Crime Policy. Protecting people from crime is one of government's main responsibilities. However, we're a constitutional republic. We, we have a constitution that gives people rights. So therefore, balance must be struck between being tough on crime and respecting people's constitutional rights. So the government can't just do whatever it wants in the name of being tough on crime. The government also has to respect our constitutional rights, the, the kind of rights uh, that I talked about in my lecture on civil liberties. So when it comes to discussing where this balance between being tough on crime and respecting people's constitutional rights is, Republican and Democrats tend to disagree uh, over how to strike that balance. Uh, Republicans tend to uh, want to be tougher on crime with more aggressive policing uh, than Democrats, as uh, as I explained in the last uh, lecture uh, on uh, political ideology. So, for example, uh, when we talk about how Republicans and Democrats disagree over how to strike that balance, one good example uh, is uh, the question of stop and frisk. Is stop and frisk a legitimate crime fighting tactic? Is stop and frisk something that government should be doing in the name of policing and protecting us from crime? Republicans tend to agree with stop and frisk, whereas Democrats disagree with stop and frisk. Uh, now, for those of you who, who may have never heard of stop and frisk, what stop and frisk is, it's a, it's a, it's a policing tactic where the police uh, very aggressively stop and frisk anyone that they believe is suspicious. And that could uh, mean four young uh, you four young men, four teenage men uh, standing on the street corner at 10 o'clock at night on a summer night. Now, just because you and your friends are standing on the street corner at 10 o'clock at night on a hot summer night uh, doesn't necessarily mean you're suspicious, doesn't necessarily mean that you look like uh, for people who are about to uh, commit a crime. But in the name of stop and frisk, the idea is that, well, anybody who's suspicious should be stopped and frisked uh, as a way to prevent crime before it happens. Uh, what the police are primarily looking for is illegal substances like a gun that could be used to commit a crime or illegal drugs. Uh, so uh, the police favor stop and frisk. It's been a tactic of New York City's government for uh, several years now. Uh, Republicans tend to uh, support it because it's an act of being tough on crime and aggressive policing. Democrats and liberals tend to oppose uh, stop and frisk and civil libertarians, people who uh, want uh, want the most expansive uh, protections for civil liberties, also uh, oppose it because they argue that stop and frisk is a violation of people's con constitutional rights. Uh, and I'll explain why in a, in a little bit in more detail uh, in a few minutes. But the idea is that, well, you can't just stop anybody who the police might think is suspicious because the police can say, well, they think everybody's suspicious. And so they can stop everyone. And and as, uh, uh, as we've seen from the data, most of the people who've been uh, subjected to stop and frisk in New York City over the course of its history uh, tend to be uh, black and Hispanic males. So it's mostly non-whites that have been stopped uh, for stop and frisk. So it's a question of whether it's a, even a racist tactic. Many people uh, believe that it is and is therefore 
not a good tactic, not a good way of fighting crime. So another big question that Democrats and liberals, Republicans and Democrats uh, debate over is the very question of what causes crime, the very basic question of what causes crime and, and experts in criminology, people who study crim- crime uh, behavior and crime fighting for a living also debate what causes crime. Uh, for example, are some people born with a genetic propensity to commit crime? In other words, is uh, being a criminal uh, partly a function of biology? Uh, is it in the criminal's DNA to tend to commit crime, to be, to have a propensity, to have a, uh, a leaning toward becoming criminal. So is it is it biology? Some people say yes. Some people say there is such a thing uh, as a crime gene that people have uh, that leads them to become criminals just in the same way that some people have uh, a biology, a DNA uh, that will make them more likely to contract cancer or some other disease? Uh, Or is crime primarily a result of social factors? Is uh, crime related to these social factors? Poverty, drugs, unemployment, lack of educational opportunities, and systemic racism. Systemic racism is racism that is born uh, within the systems that we live in so that people who uh, live in certain neighborhoods are more likely to encounter racism uh, in uh, their school systems, in uh, the way that police uh police in their neighborhoods uh, and so on and so forth so that uh, these social problems poverty, drugs, unemployment, lack of education, opportunity, systemic racism tend to exist more often in lower class neighborhoods in cities like New York and who typically lives in these lower class neighborhoods uh non-white peoples and so if we look at the uh, the uh, prison population today one third of all the people who are in prison today are African American and there are also a lot of Hispanic uh, people in prison so the majority of people in prison today are not white, uh, but the majority of people living in the United States are white. So what that means is that there's a greater proportion of 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 non-white people uh, in the prison system compared to the amount of non-white people overall, and there are less white people in prison than there is uh, relative to the amount of white people living in the whole country. Uh, So that raises an interesting question that people debate. Uh, Are non-white people mostly in jail uh, because of uh, biology, genetics, or is it the result of social factors like systemic racism and and for so for example uh non poor and non white people who uh get arrested and accused of a crime are less likely to be able to hire their own lawyers uh good lawyers uh lawyers who have more time and a greater uh, ability to focus on their case, whereas uh, white, uh, as opposed to white uh, 
people who are arrested and, and, and uh, accused of a crime who do have the ability more often than not, uh, better ability to hire private lawyers. And so as a result of that, more non-white uh, defendants in the criminal justice system end up either pleading guilty rather than going to trial or they are found guilty at trial uh, sometimes, not always, but a lot of times because of uh, a lack of, of a good lawyer, whereas white defendants might be able to are better off or better able to cut a deal that gives them probation uh, or in the case of a, of, of a drug uh, charge, the ability to go to uh, uh, rehab rather than jail. So black and Hispanic defendants, non-white defendants, usually end up going to jail more within the criminal justice system uh, as opposed to white defendants, usually for the same crime or the same charge. So that's what I mean by systemic racism, that the system itself is designed in such a way that it is racist toward non-white people. Not because the people who run the system, judges, lawyers, uh, uh, police, necessarily are, indiv are individually racist, but the system itself is set up against people who are non-white, and so the system itself is racist. And within that, you can also have a big problem of the the individual lawyers, judges, and police actually themselves being racist. Uh, so uh, is crime and, and incarceration uh, of people who are charged with crimes the function of genetics? Uh, is, it the, is it the primarily a result of social factors? Or what is it? And so that's an important question to uh, decide uh, and figure out because how you answer the question of what causes crime will determine how you think about crime policy and what you think the government should do about crime, how you think the government should go about fighting crime. Uh, now, what we know for sure is that in the past 40 years, crime in cities has decreased. Crime across the whole country has decreased, but particularly in inner cities where crime was a big problem in uh, the late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, through the 1980s and even, has decreased. Uh, but that also brings up another debate between the experts and between Democrats and liberals, uh, Republicans and Democrats, over exactly why crime has decreased in the past 40 years. Uh, has crime decreased because of social factors? Well, maybe, because we do know that in the past 40 years, the male teenage population has decreased. Uh, People have had less children uh, within the past 40 years, and so as a result of that, today there are fewer teenage uh, boys in the United States in big cities, and we know that uh, this is a group, male teenage boys, that, has, that tip, typically commits the most crime, especially... Uh, very low-level crime like possession of marijuana, uh, fighting, uh, minor assaults, graffiti, things like that, those kinds of crimes. And we also know that during the same period in uh, the past 40 years, hard drug use, especially crack cocaine, has decreased. Crack cocaine was an especially addictive uh, drug that was introduced into American cities in the late 1970s and early 1980s, and it wreaked havoc 
in inner cities, especially in black neighborhoods in inner cities. Uh, and as a result, it led to high rates of crime because of people uh, uh, fighting over uh, the right to sell crack, gangs, uh, drug dealers fighting each other over territory to sell crack, and also uh, people who are addicted to crack uh, turned to criminal activity to get money to buy more crack and uh, to keep their habit going. Uh, so as uh, crack, as the use of crack cocaine decreased and the, and the, the selling of crack cocaine decreased, so too did uh, crime decrease. Uh, so uh, that's one argument for why crime in cities has decreased in the past 40 years. That social factors caused this decrease. Uh, another school of thought, another uh, uh, feeling, another belief is that crime decreased not so much because of social factors, but because of more aggressive policing, uh, especially two uh, very particular types of crime fighting, uh, two crime fighting tactics that were used in cities like New York, and these these two tactics were heavily used uh, by the NYPD: the broken windows strategy and stop and frisk, the one I talked about uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, so what is Broken Windows? Broken Windows was a strategy that was first employed uh, in uh, the early 1990s when Rudolph Giuliani became mayor of New York in 1993. He brought in a new police commissioner, a guy by the name of William Bratton, and Bratton introduced this uh, strategy of broken windows into uh, the NYPD's uh, uh, strategy of fighting crime. Broken windows is a strategy whereby the police uh, try to prevent crime by focusing on low-level crime and not being tolerant of low-level crime. The idea is that if you focus on uh, arresting people and uh, harshly prosecuting people for every single small act of crime, like breaking a window or uh, jumping a subway turnstile or stealing uh, a pack of cigarettes, uh, gauging in graffiti. If the NYPD cracks down on these types of low-level crimes and arrests every single person who's caught engaging in this kind of low-level crime, then one of two possible things could happen that are that could help you uh, prevent higher levels of crime and prevent these people, mostly younger people, teenagers, or even even younger, 10, 11, 12-year-olds, from engaging in uh, 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 greater crime. So the idea is that, well, if you arrest uh, these kids, especially a young kid who's engaging in criminal activity for the first time by... Uh, tagging uh, a store with graffiti, you might scare that kid so much that the kid never again engages in crime. The other uh, way that you might prevent a greater amount of crime in the future is if you arrest somebody for, in, for jumping in a turnstile, for example, and you run their name through the system, you might find out that they are uh, they have a warrant out on them for some other crime. And so you might end up uh, solving other crimes, putting that person in jail. Uh, you might find a gun on them. And so by focusing on 
uh, very low level crime, uh, you will uh, hopefully uh, prevent higher levels of crime. So if you get tough from the very beginning, that has a deterrent effect. That's the idea. Uh, and uh, the other part of the broke window strategy is that if you raid certain neighborhoods of low-level crime, of young kids who uh, are committing crime uh, maybe simply because they're acting stupid, then you're going to make that neighborhood safer mm -hmm. and the people who live in that neighborhood will uh, take more pride in their neighborhood, uh, they will feel more secure, uh, and they will also hopefully trust the police more so that when uh, serious crimes happen, uh, they will help uh, the police uh, solve those crimes. And so that's the, that's the two ideas of broken windows, how broken windows strategy is supposed to work to focus uh, on aggressive policing of low-level crimes so that you can prevent higher-level crimes. Uh, the other attack to stop and frisk, as I just said, is the idea of being a very aggressive, uh, allowing the police to stop anyone they think is suspicious in order to search them, frisk them, and uh, hopefully... Uh, prevent them from committing uh, greater crimes because you might find a gun or drugs on them or you might scare them. Uh, so that's the idea. And so some uh, experts believe that one of the reasons why uh, New York City is safer today than it was, say, 40 years ago, uh, there's, l there's less crime today, especially violent crimes like homicides, murders, is because of this more aggressive policing, because of the broken windows policy, and because of the stop and frisk policy. But, as I said before, the, this kind of aggressive policing uh, has consequences. One of the consequences uh, is uh, the uh, murders that we've seen, the killings of unarmed uh, men, uh, primarily black men, at the hands of uh, police. Uh, for example, uh, Eric Garner, uh, who was uh, killed uh, by police on Staten Island uh, several years ago uh, because the police uh, tried to arrest him for selling loose cigarettes, which is a crime. You need to sell uh, loose, untaxed cigarettes uh, or even uh, loose tax cigarettes is a crime. You can't uh, sell individual cigarettes from a pack of cigarettes that you bought. So that's what he was doing. And when the police went to arrest him, uh, Eric Garner uh, resisted uh, and was put in a chokehold. And as a result of that chokehold, he was... Uh, suffocated uh, to death by the uh, police. Uh, and there have been uh, many more incidents going way back to the 90s, going back to uh, Rudy Giuliani's time that the, the mayor brought broken windows and stop and frisk uh, into the city. There was uh, the case of Abel Louima, uh, who was uh, uh, mistakenly arrested in Brooklyn in uh, the 1990s, uh, he was uh, trying to stop a fight that broke out outside of a uh, uh, outside of a of, of a club in Flatbush. Uh, during this fight that he was trying to break up, somebody punched a police officer. The cops thought that it was Abin Lima who had punched the officer. They arrested him. Uh, when they took him to the uh, to the police precinct, before putting him in a cell, they took him into uh, the the bathroom in the uh, in the precinct, and they essentially tortured him. They beat him up. They broke a uh, uh, they broke off the uh, uh, the 
the handle of a plunger of a of a of a toilet plunger and they used it to rape him uh they stick it they 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 uh they stuck him with it they stuck it inside him uh and there were many other uh, incidents of uh, police brutality and police killings that many people blame on this more aggressive policing that was instituted by Rudy Giuliani, which essentially gave the police permission to act aggressively. And uh, in many cases, this aggression got out of hand. Uh, Stop and Frisk also had the uh, uh, had the had a problem, uh, which was that it was basically unconstitutional. That you the Constitution does not allow the police to simply stop you and search you simply because a cop thinks that you look suspicious. Uh, the NYPD stop and frisk policy led to a federal lawsuit, Floyd Al versus City of New York, in 2013. Uh, and uh, the lawsuit was a uh, lawsuit. Floyd was uh, a, uh, a young man who had been stopped and frisked several times, uh, and he uh, and a group of other. Uh, young men who had been stopped multiple times uh, decided to sue the city of New York uh, saying that the city uh, with its stop and frisk policy was violating the constitutional rights of the people who were stopped. The constitutional right cited by the judge in the case uh, is the Fourth Amendment's prohibition of unlawful search and seizure. According to the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, and you might remember that I talked about this in, in my lecture on civil liberties, states that the police cannot simply uh, stop and search someone's person or property without a good reason, without a warrant, or something called probable cause. So as a result of this uh, lawsuit, the judge in the case ruled that the way that the NYPD was engaging in sovereign frisk resulted in the constitutional violation of the rights of the people who were being stopped. Okay. Uh, the government, according to the Constitution, according to the Fourth Amendment, cannot search you or your property without your consent. So if the police knock on your door and knock on your on the door of your home and say, we'd like to come in and search your home or we'd like to search you, if you say yes, then that's fine. Uh, if you, you have a right to waive your constitutional rights and, and you can give the government permission, the police permission, to search your property. So the government needs your consent and or judicial warrant. And I talked about that, you know, remember in my lecture on civil liberties where the government, uh, the police or the district attorney will have to go to a judge and convince the judge that they have a good enough reason to search you. And then the judge will give them a warrant, which is a piece of paper that, uh, that allows the police to search you or your property even without your consent and or probable cause. So even if uh, there might be some cases where, some instances where the police don't have time to go get a judicial warrant and in an emergency situation, they can stop or search someone or arrest someone uh, without a warrant if they have what's called probable cause and probable cause is a, co a good common sense reason to think that someone is engaged is either engaging in or is recently engaged in illegal activity so for example let's say I'm a police officer I'm walking down Atlantic Avenue in the middle of July in broad daylight 
and it's 95 degrees out. And I'm walking past the bank, and as soon as I walk past past this bank, the bank alarm goes off, and I see someone run out the door wearing a ski mask and holding two bags that seem to be full of something. I don't have a warrant to stop that person if I think that person may have just robbed that bank. But I do have probable cause. I do have a a good reason to probably believe that this person is engaged in a crime. So I don't need their consent to stop them or search those bags or search that person's pockets. I don't need a judicial warrant because it's it. I by the time I go to a judge and get a warrant, that probable robber is gone. But I do have probable cause, so I can stop that person and arrest them right away and and search the bags. Uh, and why do I have probable cause? Because it's ninety five degrees out. The guy's wearing a mask. What is he doing wearing a mask in the middle of July, 95 degrees? He's holding two bags and he's running out of a bank where the uh, the bank alarm has just gone off. So, you know, 99% of people would say, yeah, that guy just robbed that bank. Most people would say that. And so I have a good common sense reason as, as a cop to stop that person because I've got probable cause. Here's another instance, uh, and your textbook talks about this. Uh, let's say uh, I'm driving down the highway and I'm speeding. The A cop pu- pulls me over, comes up to my window to get my license and registration insurance, and uh, he says... Uh, I'd like to search your trunk, the trunk of your car. Does the uh, officer, does the police officer have a right to search your trunk? No, not without your consent. If you consent to allowing the officer to search your trunk, that's fine. But if you say no, he cannot, he or she cannot search your trunk Why? Because they don't have probable cause. Why? Because the reason they stopped you was speeding and they have no reason to search your car in relation to the speeding. All they can do is stop you and issue you a ticket for speeding and that's it. Uh, Now, what if though, what if it's this scenario? The cop pulls you over for speeding. They go up to your window, knock on your, uh, knock on your window, uh, and ask you for your license, registration, and insurance. But as the cop looks into the window to talk to you, he sees a bag of cocaine, or what he thinks is cocaine, sitting there, on the passenger seat in plain view, meaning that he doesn't really have to do anything special to see that bag of cane. He just sees it. It's right in his plain sight. Can he search that bag? And if he determines that it's a bag of cane, can he arrest you? Yes. That is what's called a plain sight search. He can search anything that's in plain sight. He can act on anything he sees in plain sight, meaning he, meaning the cop. If the cop uh, were to uh, ask you to get out of your car because you were speeding, and then if he were to go into your car and then look under the seat, and if he pulled out a bag of cane, that would not be an okay search because that's not a plain sight search. Plain sight search is what he can see simply by talking to you. He can't see under your seat. So if he can't see under your seat, he can't search under your seat without a good reason, without a probable cause, without a warrant, or without your consent.
So anything in his plain sight he can see, anything not in his plain sight he, he can't see. Uh, now, what if the cop pulls you over for speeding and he goes up to your window and he starts to ask you for your license uh, insurance and registration and all of a sudden he hears banging on your uh, from within your trunk and he hears somebody yelling please let me out uh, I've been kidnapped can the cop uh, forcibly open your trunk and search it yes again that's an example of probable cause hearing somebody uh, knocking from within and yelling help me I've been uh, kidnapped gives the cop the right to bust open your trunk uh, to see if there's somebody in there and if there is he can arrest you uh, but if he doesn't hear anything in the trunk and he's got no reason to believe that there's anything else involved but you speeding, he cannot open your trunk without your permission, without your consent. All he can do is give you uh, a speeding ticket. Okay. Uh, now, what if the police conduct an illegal search and find something illegal? Can they arrest you? Well, yeah, they probably are going to arrest you, but uh, that illegal material cannot be used against you as evidence in a trial. And that's because of something called the exclusionary rule, which says that the government has to exclude from trial any evidence that was obtained illegally. So a judge in your trial will have to exclude that evidence. So let's say, for example, that a cop uh, pulls you over for speeding and uh, for no reason really makes you get out of the car and uh, searches the car and finds illegal drugs or illegal weapon or something illegal and they arrest you for that. Before you go to trial, uh, your lawyer will, if he, is a good, if he or she is a good lawyer, your lawyer will go to the judge and argue that the police had no right to search your car, that all they did was pull you over speeding, and that they had absolutely no probable cause, no good reason to search your car. So therefore, anything they found in the car cannot be used against you. So even though they found something illegal, they cannot put you on trial for possession of an illegal weapon or possession of illegal drugs or anything like that. You won't get the, you won't get the drugs or the gun back, but according to the exclusionary rule, that uh, judge will not let uh, the trial uh, use evidence, use that evidence. And if that's the only evidence they have against you, then the district attorney will probably drop the charge against you because he or she knows that without that weapon or without that drugs that will be, would be presented to the jury, the jury will never find you guilty. So according to the exclusionary rule, material that is illegally obtained cannot be used as evidence in a trial. Okay. So this, the, any search has to be based on consent, a judicial warrant, or probable cause, and anything obtained from a search without one of these three things can be thrown out according to the exclusionary rule, can be, uh, not, cannot be used as evidence. Okay, so that's the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment deals with uh, search and seizure. The Fifth Amendment, as I said in my lecture on constitutional uh, civil liberties, uh, affords two constitutional protections, the right to due process, which means that before the government can take either your uh, freedom away by putting you in jail or your life away 
through capital punishment, through execution, the government has to prove that you that you're guilty in a court of law according to a a, a fair process which gives you the right to defend yourself, to have a lawyer, uh, and all of that, because the idea is, uh, and I'm sure you've all heard this before, uh, somebody who's charged with a crime is presumed innocent until proven guilty. So uh, even if you've been arrested, even if you've been charged with a crime, you are constitutionally innocent until you are proven guilty and until you're proven guilty in a fair process in a due process due is another word for fair you cannot be put in jail you cannot be executed Uh, and the other thing that the fifth amendment does is protect you from self-incrimination meaning that you do not have to answer any questions uh, in a uh, in a, a, a situation where the police are asking you questions, uh, you and in a trial you don't have to uh, answer a question. You don't have to testify in a trial. You cannot be forced to testify against yourself. You cannot be forced to self-incriminate. Incriminate means to get yourself in trouble. Uh, and uh, I, I, you know, remember I also talked about. Uh, the very famous uh, Supreme Court case from 1966, United States versus Miranda, which was a case where uh, the police in Arizona arrested this guy Miranda, uh, and during questioning, Miranda confessed to a crime, and his uh, after he was convicted of the of the crime based on his self incrimination. Uh, his lawyer appealed all the way up to Supreme Court and said that uh, by uh, by interrogating him without letting him know that uh, what his Fifth Amendment rights were, the police had violated his Fifth Amendment rights by forcing him to self-incriminate. And the Supreme Court agreed and said that in a, that it's not just enough for people to have Fifth Amendment rights that the police are required, the government is required to uh, tell people what their rights are uh, because not everybody may know what their rights are. And so that's why uh, today, before the police either interrogate someone or arrest someone or just after they've arrested someone before, before they talk and ask questions of somebody who's been arrested they always uh, inform them of their Miranda rights, their right to remain silent, their right to have a lawyer, so on and so forth. Their constitutional rights uh, is is explained to them before uh, any questioning commences by the police. Uh, the Sixth Amendment is the right to a speedy and public trial, so... If you are uh, charged with a crime and you're going to go to trial, the government cannot uh, delay that trial forever because you are presumed innocent. You have a right to uh, have the uh, situation dealt with quickly, and so therefore you have a right to a speedy and public trial. Uh, That trial is also a right, you also have a right to a trial by jury. Uh, so that a jury of your peers, people like you, will decide whether you're whether you're guilty or not, uh, whether you committed the crime or not. And the Eighth Amendment has two parts to it. It's uh, the Eighth Amendment says that uh, the government cannot uh, sub- subject you to excessive bail. So uh, if a judge uh, Agrees to let you out of jail while you're while you're waiting trial or during trial, uh, if you pay if you agree to pay a certain amount, that amount cannot be excessive. It cannot be say five billion dollars, something that's so much more than any reasonable person could pay. Uh, and the Eighth Amendment also protects you against cruel or unusual punishment, so that. If you're arrested and you're being interrogated, the police cannot beat a confession out of you. If you're in jail, the 
the uh, the, the uh, prison guards cannot subject you to any type of torture uh, or unusual punishment, uh, anything that would be considered cruel or, un or unusual punishment. Uh, so, for the past several years, a debate over criminal justice reform has begun. Uh, uh, people uh, discussing ways to make the criminal justice system more fair, uh, less uh, systemic, uh, systemically racist. What uh, there are a couple of things that have been talked about uh, in terms of conducting criminal justice, justice reform. One is bail and sentence reform. Uh, bail and sentencing uh, is often uh, unfair, uh, and the data suggests that there is uh, systemic racism involved, if not uh, actual individual racism from judges who decide bail and sentencing reform. There is at least institutional racism uh, because the way the system works is uh, against uh, people who uh, are uh, poor, people who don't have the money to pay bail uh, or get good lawyers uh, tend to suffer more than people who do get good lawyers. So that's part economics but also part uh, race as well because uh, more of the people who are poor defendants who can't afford good lawyers, who can't afford bail, tend to be non-white. Yeah, so uh, uh, not every white defendant is rich, but, there are, but if you compare white defendants and non-white defendants, more white defendants are able to afford bail and more white defendants are able to afford good lawyers who make better deals for sentencing. So, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and the data shows that wealthy defendants, and if you compare wealthy defendants uh, to poor defendants, white defendants and non-white defendants, wealthy and white defendants tend to get better sentences than uh, non-white and poor defendants, uh, primarily because they, because white and wealthier defendants get better lawyers who can argue for less, less years in jail for the same type of crime that would get more years in jail for a black or Hispanic defendant or a poor or white defendant. Uh, and when it comes to bail, uh, white and wealthier defendants are more often able to raise the money to pay for bail. Uh, and there have been uh, several recent uh, uh, horrible, horrific cases of uh, people who uh, spend lots of time in jail and who've been hurt or even uh, died in jail as a result of the fact that they couldn't make bail. So one of the most famous and recent New York City history is uh, the story of a young uh, black man called uh, named Khalif Browder who was uh, arrested, uh, and it turns out falsely arrested, uh, after he was accused of stealing a backpack. And uh, he was charged with uh, theft, uh, and uh, he couldn't make bail because his family uh, was not able to raise the money for bail. And so as a result, he was sent to Rikers Island. Uh, he was sent to Rikers Island uh, uh, to, to wait trial. Uh, and uh, he was beaten, he was picked on, he was subjected to uh, uh, physical and emotional abuse uh, while he was there, and he ended up killing himself uh, because of the, uh, the, uh, the, the effect of all that uh, abuse. 
And so this is somebody who probably would not have been in that situation if he had been able to afford bail. Uh, and so uh, a debate has begun among criminal justice reformers. Uh, should uh, should uh, people be subjected to that kind of abuse uh, when they haven't been uh, accused, when they haven't been found guilty of anything yet, simply because they cannot make bail? Uh, another uh, as another idea uh, within this uh, talk of criminal justice reform is decriminalizing marijuana possession. So not making marijuana uh, legal, but decriminalizing it, which means uh, not subjecting people who are arrested for uh, marijuana possession to a very harsh uh, prosecution. Uh, so instead of arresting and uh, putting people in jail for marijuana possession, especially low amounts of marijuana possession. And I'm not talking about people selling drugs, but rather people who are simply using drugs recreationally, that instead of uh, subjecting them to harsh prosecution, uh, instead of arresting them, cops give them uh, simple summonses uh, which is not an arrest where the cop basically gives you a ticket, you go home right away, and then you have to show up uh, some weeks later uh, to either argue that you are not guilty or guilty, but even if you're found guilty, the most that will happen is you will pay a fine uh, in these low-level criminal courts where nobody goes to jail, where the toughest... Uh, 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 sentences are uh, uh, monetary fines and where nobody is put in jail uh, once they're arrested nobody's really arrested even uh, you simply get what's called a summons a ticket from, uh, from a, a, a cop and then of course the biggest part of the biggest aspect of this uh, discussion over uh, criminal justice reform is policing reform, police reform of uh, uh, changing the way police are trained uh, to uh, prevent instances where police get out of hand, uh, like uh, in the instance of George Floyd being arrested and then being killed as a result of a cop uh, kneeling on his neck for 10 or 12 minutes for however how long that was, uh, or Eric Garner being put in chokehold. So one of the uh, 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 ideas is to ban chokeholds completely uh, so that cops are not allowed to use chokeholds uh, in uh in any circumstances, except when their life is really at danger. Uh, and then another aspect of police reform is to keep better record keeping on police activities, uh, better uh, uh, records of uh, police disciplinary records, uh, especially when it comes to police who've been fired. So one typical uh, one uh, you know typical scenario is uh, among cops who've been involved in uh, the killing of unarmed black men in recent years is that some of these cops were cops who had been uh, fired from another police force because they were deemed unfit. But what happened is that they simply went to another town and were able to get uh, hired by the new police force. Why? Because the record of their having fired for being considered unfit by the previous police force was not on the record. Did not uh, get sent to 
other police forces around the country to say, you really shouldn't hire this person. There's something wrong with this person and they shouldn't be a cop. So that's the other thing that's uh, been talked about in the process of discussing police reform is having a system whereby if a police officer is fired for misconduct or because of uh, a feeling that the cop is not emotionally fit to be a cop, then that news, that record, is sent to every other police force in the United States so that if that person goes to try to get a job as a cop somewhere else, that police force they apply to will know all about it, will be able to uh, uh, decide uh, whether or not they want to hire this person based on a true knowing of their of their whole record. Uh, so this debate over criminal justice reform is a response to several things. Uh, recent police shootings, uh, George, uh, the, the, and other killings, George Floyd, Tamir Rice, uh, Abdul uh, Eric Garner, uh, Michael Brown years ago in, in uh, Missouri, which uh, is what led to the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, which has put a lot of pressure on uh, government uh, to recognize that there's a problem here that needs to be addressed in our criminal justice system. Uh, and one other thing that the Black Lives Matter movement has, uh, has uh, made people aware of uh, and that's the increasing recognition of systemic racism that there is a problem in the way that our system is set up that is designed to work against uh, non-white poor people. That it's not a fair system. That our criminal justice system is supposed to be fair. It's supposed to treat everyone equally. But the way that it's set up in the way we do bail, sentencing, the way that lawyers are uh, hired and given to people who cannot afford them uh, is a system that maybe is not designed uh, purposefully to work against certain groups of people, but it does. And that's really what matters. It doesn't matter what, whether this is, uh, whether this racism is intentional or not, it's a fact of life, and it's there, and it needs to be dealt with. Uh, it's also a response. This criminal justice reform uh, is also uh, a response to the degrees in crime that we've seen over the past 40 years and a desire to reduce the cost of prosecution and incarceration. One of the interesting things about criminal justice reform is that it's actually something that conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats, uh, mostly agree on. They don't agree on every part of it, but they agree that we should do something to uh, keep more people out of jail with sentencing reform and bail reform decriminalizing amount of possession, doing things that lead to less people going to jail, not just non-white people, but white people as well. Uh, and the reason for that uh, is twofold. Uh, for liberals, the focus is on systemic racism. But for conservatives, the focus for doing these things, for having this type of reform, is not exactly racism, which most conservatives would probably deny that this racism exists or exists to the same level that liberals think it does. But for conservatives, it's a, it's a desire to save money. If you put fewer pre people in jail, if you incarcerate fewer people, if you uh, prosecute fewer people, 
then you don't have to spend as much money uh, housing people in jail and feeding people in jail. Uh, so the desire for criminal justice reform uh, is agreed to, for the most part, by Republican Democrats, by conservatives and liberals, but for different reasons. Conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats have different reasons for why they support criminal justice reform. But regardless of why they do, they, for the most part, agree that there's a need for some bail reform, a need for some sentence reform, and a need for some decriminalization of low-level drug possession. Uh, along with that, there's also a debate now about uh, the rights of people who have gone to jail and are now and have now been released. One uh, f- one aspect of this has to do with voting rights. So uh, most states, uh, well, actually all states take away your right to vote once you've been convicted of a crime. So if you're convicted of a crime and you're sent to jail, you don't have the right to vote, right? So people in jail don't get the right to vote. They lose their right to vote as a result of being convicted of a crime. What happens after you get out of jail is a different story. And that depends on state by state. Some states uh, give people the right to vote back once they've been released from jail. Some states do not. Some states only give certain people the right to vote after they are in jail, uh, meaning only the only the only people who were convicted of nonviolent. Uh, uh, non-violent offenses. Uh, so some people will get their right to vote back after they've been out in jail. Other people won't. Uh, some states uh, say that, well, really anybody can, anybody theoretically can get their right to vote back, but it's not automatic. You have to go before a judge and get the judge to agree to let you vote again. So uh, part of the criminal justice reform uh, debate is uh, over whether uh, states should uh, be more open to letting more ex-convicts vote. Uh, On theory that, on the reasoning that, well, once you're out of jail, that means you've paid your price, you've done your time, and now you're being let back into society, and part of being let back into society should mean that you now have the right to vote again. Uh, Another aspect of this uh, debate has to do with employment prospects for ex-convicts. It's very hard for people who've been in prison and get out of prison to get a job, and that's because uh, most states and lo- local governments uh, require uh, or allow uh, a question on a job application, have you ever been convicted of a, of a crime? And by law, you have to answer that question uh, truthfully. And so if you've been to jail and you answer that question Uh, truthfully and you say yes I've been in jail uh, it's going to be very hard to get a job uh, when employers know that you've been been to jail and so uh, many cities around the country now and and New York is one of them have passed laws that uh, prevent employers from asking whether people have been in jail especially if somebody's been to jail for a non-violent crime. And New York's law only allows, New York City's law only allows uh, that question to be asked of a job applicant 
if the job is related to either law enforcement or the protection of children. So if you're applying for a job uh, as a teacher or you're applying for a job as a, as a school bus driver or if you're applying for a job as a security guard, you can be asked and you will be asked if you've ever been convicted of crime. But if you're applying for a job at McDonald's or Target, you won't be because those jobs don't uh, involve law enforcement. Uh, you don't have to carry a gun for, or another weapon or some kind like that for those kinds of jobs. So this is all part of the criminal justice reform debate uh, that has been going on recently. Uh, and it's because of the idea that uh, being put in jail is not only supposed to be about punishment, but it's supposed to be about rehabilitation. And so allowing people to vote and especially allowing people to be able to get a job after they get out will uh, lead them to not, uh, hopefully will lead them to not go back to a criminal lifestyle. So that's the end of uh, this chapter. Uh, I will see you for the next one.